We have it. Remember the story of Thanksgiving. Yes. How many of you know that they tried uh, communal? I think is what they called it. It was. How many of you know they tried socialism in the first colony? Yes, sir. How many of you know it failed miserably? Yes, sir. Amen. And it was replaced with our form of capitalism. That's right. Right. And that's when they begin to prosper and men begin to work. Right. Amen. Right. Uh, I may bring something on that uh, next year. Uh, I, I, I really spent some time digging and studying the history. And a lot of what they're teaching their kids today is not true. It just is, it's just, just flat out not true. And it just blows my mind. But anyway, I am thankful. I am thankful. Uh, for the Word of God and, and, and the ability to read. Amen. You can learn anything if you'll just read. Uh, a lot of times I, I don't think I'd get in trouble if I could quit reading, but I read enough to where I, I, I can catch when people's telling stories. And I, But anyway, let's just get into the study tonight. Let's, if you will, uh, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 3. I'm on. Hurry and get into the study tonight so hopefully we can finish up this chapter. I'm going to try to get this whole chapter in. There's a lot in here, uh, but we're going to go through it pretty quickly because most of it is self-explanatory. You don't need a whole lot of comment. Uh, sometimes you can comment on a passage so much that you distort it when you just need to just let it say what it says and go on. Amen. And the reason I say this is because I've read a lot of commentators who did just that. They distort it. They, they change it. Uh, but uh, we're going to let it say what it says and leave it like it is and believe what he says. Amen? All right, let me give you the outline real quickly. I've been giving you the outline for each chapter at the beginning. Number one, Roman numeral one, the complaints answered. That's verses one through eight. There are going to be three things under that section. The advantages in verses 1 and 2. The Jews want to know what advantage they have being a Jew. What, does it, what advantage is it being a Jew or being circumcised? That question is asked and answered. Then you have the attributes in verse 3 and 4. Uh, God's truth. Amen. God's word is truth. Amen. That's the attribute of God. Then you have some assumptions in verses 5 through 8 we'll deal with when we get there. Roman numeral 2, we'll see the condition affirmed. That's verses 9 through 12. Uh, we're going to see a question stated in verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Boy, that sounds like today, don't a lot of people think they're better than other people. You know, the Jews still believe they're better than we are Gentiles. They still believe they're better than we are. They still believe because they are Jews that they have a guaranteed ticket to heaven, some of them. They, they, they believe that. They really do. But the, then, after the question is stated in verse 9, you have quoted scripture, and that's going to be verses 10 through 12. Paul, poor Paul, he just lays it on him. It's good. It really is. Then number three, Roman numeral three, you have the conduct addressed. That's verses 13 through 27. You have a list of sins in 13 through 18, and then you have the lost salvation in verses 19 through 27. <coughs> then you have the case adjourned. The case adjourned. Paul approaches this chapter much like a lawyer. His brilliance shines forth in this chapter because much like a lawyer, he asks questions to help come to the truth. By a series of questions, he's help, helping to reveal truths. Like a lawyer in a courtroom continues to ask questions and those questions and the answers lead you to a logical conclusion, the truth. That's what Paul's doing in this chapter, basically. And then at the end here, you have the case adjourned. And you'll see three things there, verses 28 through 31. Uh, first, you'll see that it's 
the exclusion from faith. In verse 28, uh, we're saved by faith without the deeds of the law. There is an exclusion in our salvation. The deeds of the law, your works won't do anything for you. Then you have the equalness of faith in verses 29 through 30. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile. Uh, the, the ground's level at Calvary, amen? And then you have the establishment of faith. So you have the exclusion from faith, the equalness of faith, and then the establishment of faith. Verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? No, we establish the law. The law allowed for a substitute for sin. Do you remember if they sinned, if they brought the proper sacrifice, God would accept that sacrifice? But it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away their sin. But when the Lamb of God came, the perfect sacrifice, He didn't do away with the law. He fulfilled the law. And in fulfilling the law, He established faith. When we put our faith and trust in Him, He is our substitute. He is our lamb, if, if that makes any sense. Hopefully it will by the time we get to the end. But let's go ahead. That's the outline. Uh, uh, trust me, I spent that, that was a very hard chapter. I don't know. I, I almost, almost walked away and not outlined that chapter. This, that was the hardest chapter I ever outlined for me. Personally, it just didn't click for some reason for a long time. Uh, but anyway, in Romans 1, we see that the heathen needed the gospel. We've already talked about it. Then last time in Romans 2, we talked about how the Hebrews need the gospel. Here in chapter 3, we're going to see all of humanity needs the gospel. Amen. That's right. We're all sinners and we're all in need of a Savior. Yeah. And uh, uh, here I'm going to do something a little different. I gave you an outline, but I'm not going to follow that outline. I'm going to follow the questions. There's six basic questions that he's asked here. There's more than that in there, but there's six main questions that I can break it up into, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to break this chapter up into six sections and deal with six questions that he deals with. Because he not only asked the question, but he also gave the answer. So we're going to look at what he asked, why he asked it, and uh, the answer that he gave for it. So the first one is going to be in verse 1 and 2. Look at it. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much, every way, chiefly because that into them, that's the Jews, the, the circumcision, were committed the oracles of God. So uh, Paul is continuing his discussion about the, the, the circumcision uh, implying the Jews from chapter 2. And like I said, many of the Jews were looking upon their spiritual blessing as a Jew as their golden ticket to heaven just because they were a physical Jew. Because they were born a physical Jew, they were thinking that gave them special access to heaven, and it don't. Uh, Paul told them that being a physical Jew doesn't matter in this time period. It don't matter if you're if it don't matter if you can trace yourself back to Abraham himself. You must be born again. Amen. You have to accept. It's not the physical circumcision that matters. It's the spiritual right. circumcision, and that's what Paul is talking about. And 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 there is a question there. What advantage then hath the Jew? What if, if he saves the Gentiles and the Jews alike, then what advantage is there of being a Jew? They're used to being spoiled, God's chosen people. They, they've also been had their britches beat off through history as well. But what advantage do they have? Well, he says much every way, chiefly because that unto them, the Jews, were committed the oracles of God. God granted to them, gave them the Word of God. They had the Word of God. Oracles, the, the word oral uh, comes from that. Think of, makes you think of uh, something to do with the mouth. 
They have the, the spoken promises of God. Amen? God spoke. It was pinned down by the prophets and they were entrusted with the Word of God. Did you know every author in this Bible was Jewish? Yes. Now there's some that debate whether Luke was or not and whether he was or not, he would have been a proselyte even if he wasn't born a Jew. He would have probably been a proselyte. So it would have been Jewish either way. But every one of the authors... I believe we're Jewish. Yes, sir. So the word of God was given through them to us. Amen. So they had the promises way before. They had the written word in their hands way before it ever came to the Gentiles. Right. Right. All right. Now the second one is in verses 3 and 4. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, thou, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. There in verses 3 and 4, uh, the question basically is, will Israel's unbelief nullify the word of God, the oracles of God? Will their unbelief nullify the word of God? No, not at all. Uh, the answer is, of course not. Uh, what I don't know if you remember, but years ago, I think it was back in the 90s, late 90s, there was a bumper sticker that came out. And you started seeing it a lot on people's cars. And it said, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. <coughs> Any of y'all old ones ever remember seeing that? Yep. Yep. I found one later. And I ran it on my truck for quite a few years. And it said, God said it, that settles it, whether you believe it or not. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. That's right. It don't matter if you believe. Your belief doesn't change facts. Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in hell. Right. But that don't change the fact they're one. Right. Right. Atheists don't believe in God. Does that mean God don't exist? No, of course not. Your belief doesn't change the facts. Right. Okay? And it says, God is true. Uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, yes. and the life. Thy word is truth. Amen. So, uh, I like it where he talked about letting God be true, but every man a liar. That's right. There's no exemptions to that. That's if I say something that goes against this book, I'm the liar. Doesn't matter how much I believe it. Doesn't matter how much I'm convinced of it. If it's against this book, if it's not what he said, not what he meant it to say, and I twist it, I'm the liar. Yes, sir. Amen. Let God be true. I don't care who it is, be it pastor, preacher, teacher, bishop, whatever they call themselves, apostle or, or father or whatever they want to call themselves, uh, your grandma, your mom, it doesn't matter. Let God be true and every man a liar. We have the final authority and, it, and, and he don't walk around on two legs. Amen. It's the word of God. Amen. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father right now. All right. Now the third question that we're going to be dealing with is in verses 5 through 8. Look at this. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God... What shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. I'll explain that in just a second. Now watch. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abound through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather... As we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, uh, they accused Paul of teaching this. They said that he was teaching this. Let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Now, basically, he's saying, if our sin brings out or shows that God is righteous, isn't he unfair to punish us for that sin? If I sin, but I meant to do it, like say I told a lie, 
to get someone to come in where they could hear the gospel and they got saved. Well, what my lie? Good thing would God be unjust to punish me for lying? I did it for a good cause. See, my lying brought about or revealed or showed God's righteousness. Someone was able to get saved. Someone heard the gospel. Now, here's the problem. Uh, look at verse 6. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? If God can't, if God can't judge sin because it's sin, then he's not being just. A just God judges every sin. Look at verse 7. Uh, no matter the reason God's going to judge it. Uh, verse 7. For if the truth of God had more abound through my lie, say the gospel went out further, so that guy got called to preach, and he went on and preached, and many more got saved. Okay, so, so God hath abound through my lie unto his glory. Why yet am I also judged as a sinner? I'll tell you why. Because I sinned, I lied. I hope that makes sense to you. It's just as plain as can be. Yeah. Now, Bob Jones Sr. used to say this. He used to say, it's never right to do wrong to get to do right. That sounds like, a, sounds like it gets complicated, but, but it's never right to do something wrong That's right. for a chance to do something right. right. Yeah. God's going to judge sin regardless of the motive behind it. The Catholic Church was big on that, especially in the Dark Ages. They was going to convert the world to Catholicism. And they did it by making them recant what they believed. If they believed the Bible, they was wanting everybody to go to Catholicism. They were torturing people, burning them at the stakes. They were, they were killing people. They, it was terrible what they were doing. And they was doing it in the name of Christ. And in their eyes, they thought they was doing right. Much like Saul was doing before God saved him on the road of Damascus. Saul was persecuting the church thinking he was doing right. Thinking he was doing just. Thinking he was serving God. He was a good servant of God. But he was persecuting the church. He was doing wrong. Okay? And if you do wrong, no matter what reasons for doing wrong, God is just or a just God would have to judge you for it, if that makes any sense. So that's basically how that one works out. And here's something else that you need to know. God's going to get the glory whether you do right or wrong either way. He's going to get the glory when it's all said and done. Uh, and, and a just God, like I said, will punish sin, no matter for what reason you sin. Now the fourth question, the fourth question is in verses 9 through 20. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Boy, people think, well, I seek after God. No, 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 today. Listen, when I got saved, I wasn't looking for God. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Man's not looking for God. You say, well, what about all these other religions that do all this crazy penance stuff? They're not seeking the God of truth. They're seeking a God that will line up with what they believe. They are seeking a God that will condone their sin or condone their behavior. They're not looking for a true God to totally submit to. Amen. They're not looking for the God of the Bible. There is none that understand. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat, let's see. Yeah, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their tongues. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. You can't hardly even watch TV anymore for the cursing and filth on TV. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. Here's probably the worst indictment of them all. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Do you know if people fear God like they ought to, you wouldn't have to lock your doors. You could leave your keys in your car. When you went into the store, you could leave your kids in the car. When you went into the store, you'd never have to worry about your, your, your daughters or your grandchildren or your wife. You wouldn't have to worry about crime anymore. But people don't fear God. People that fear God won't mess with stuff. People that fear God will do right. Amen. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it said to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. He's talking about uh, the Jews there again. Now watch. Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's right. Now in verses 9 through 20, that was a little lengthy section. Most of it is common sense. Look at verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now we know that we all are sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. None of us are righteous. Only one ever lived righteously Amen. and that was the Lord Jesus Christ so that's just common sense uh, but let's look at it a little bit slower verse 9 basically the question is are the Jews better than the Gentiles what then are we better than they we Paul, uh, Paul was a Jew so are we better than they no in this dispensation on this side of Calvary all must come to Jesus the same way. Right. By faith. There is no exception. Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter. Male, female. And Paul proves in this chapter that all of humanity, Jew and Gentile, are sinners and corrupt mm -hmm. in need right. of a Savior. In verses 10 and 11, our conscience is corrupt. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. In verse 12, our character is corrupt. They are all gone out of the way. They have all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Our conversation is corrupt. It talked about the poison in our tongue, the, the, the ass, the poison, as a poisonous snake there. And the poison that people kill each other, kill each other's testimony with their words and their mouth is full of bitterness and cursing and, and even their conduct. Our conduct is corrupt. Then in verses 19 and 20, it's, again, it's basically self-explanatory. Uh, but what a lot of people don't catch is verses 10 through 18. Paul's quoting from the Old Testament. He quotes from verses from all over the place. Uh, for instance, uh, verses 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are, are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's Psalms 14. 1 through 3. I mean, it, it, it's there. Verse 13 is Psalms 5 9. Uh, verse 14 is Psalms 10, verse 7. Verse 15 through 17 is Isaiah 59, verses 7 through 9. And then verse 18 is Psalm 36, 1. Paul concludes that question, are the Jews better than the Gentiles, by, by saying no and reminding them that the law was given to them to show them, to reveal to them just how wicked man was and that included the Jew because the Jews didn't keep the law That's right. they, they, they failed miserably as well okay. not only did the Jews fail to keep the law that was given to them by Moses on Mount Sinai but the Gentiles failed to keep the law that was written in their heart yeah. so not only did the Jews fail to keep God's law so did the Gentiles it was written in our heart and in our conscience. 
that we shouldn't steal, that we shouldn't commit adultery. And yet, they did it anyway. They failed. So, again, his basic conclusion was, all have sinned, all have come short of the glory of God. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. So what does that mean? That means all of humanity is in need of a Savior, Jew or Gentile. So he laid, he's, he's making a good case and he's laying it out there pretty plain. Then the fifth question basically shows up. And now this one's a little bit different. In this section, he, he makes a bunch of statements and then he has a couple questions at the end of this section, but it kind of goes together. Watch this, verse 21. But now, I like that. See, he was talking about the law and the flesh being justified uh, not by the law because the law was sent just to give us the knowledge of sin. Paul said, had it not been for the law, he wouldn't know what, he wouldn't know what sin was. Had the law said, thou shalt not commit adultery or thou shalt not covet, he wouldn't have known what it was, but but the law put a name on it, so to speak. So you know what it is. But now, when he says, but now, he's on the other side of Calvary. The Messiah has come. He has died on the cross. He has been buried and he has rose again. Amen. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law testified of Jesus and the prophets testified of Jesus. So they were a witness to what he did. Now watch. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely, freely, not of works, you didn't buy it, you didn't earn it, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God has set forth to be a propitiation through, through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. I'll explain that in a minute. Through the forbearance of God, God was patient. He was patient and he allowed the blood of bulls and goats to temporarily cover the sins of the past. They didn't have a perfect <coughs> sacrifice. For it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Right. But when the perfect sacrifice had come, the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, the perfect sacrifice taketh away the sins of the whole world. Ain't that good when you get a hold of that? Mm. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness, that we might be just, and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. When we put our faith in Him, He justifies us. He's yeah. the justifier, and right. we're made just because of what He did. Right. Now, wherein is boasted then? Wherein is boasting? Can I boast about being a Jew? Can I boast about being a Gentile? Can I boast about keeping the law? Can I boast about church membership or any other thing? No, because he did it all. Jesus did it all. There is no boasting. It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Amen. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Right. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision, that's the Jew, by faith, and the uncircumcision, there's the Gentile, through faith. Now some people try to make a big deal out of the by faith and through faith, but it, you can't do a whole lot with it because I found other places where it says that we're justified through faith and they're justified by faith. You know, it's the same thing basically. 
It's basically the same thing. We're both Jew and Gentile, saved by faith or through faith. Amen. Uh, now, in this section, verses 21, Paul is basically answering how we get saved now. How we get saved now. It, it's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 25, it said he became the propitiation for our sins. That propitiation is the act of appeasing wrath. God's wrath on sin demanded a sacrifice. And Jesus became that sacrifice for us. Now, and it said that that sacrifice uh, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. Uh, just like an innocent animal shed its blood in the Old Testament to temporarily cover their sins, Jesus' blood was a perfect, sinless blood, and it took away our sins. We are totally forgiven because of that. Amen? He became our sacrifice. That's why the veil in the temple was rent in twain when Jesus died on the cross because there was no more need of any more sacrifices. The perfect one had come. The perfect one had shed his blood. It was over and done. When, he was, when God was finished with the veil, he ripped it. Amen. Uh, now, I think I pretty well covered that. Now let me give you this last one. Man, I moved through there faster than I thought I would. I, I really didn't think I was going to get through there so fast. But look at this. Uh, the last one is in verse, the sixth one, I mean, is in verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. You say, wait a minute, law and faith can't work together. Yes, it can and it does. Our faith does not nullify the law. Rather, contrarily, faith fulfills the law. Jesus was born under the law. He walked under the law. He kept the law perfect while he was here on earth for 33 and a half years. And by, and when he went to the Calvary, he was fulfilling the law that was demanded. Sin demands death. He was fulfilling that law. But he was the substitute for our sins. See, the law allowed for substitutes. And he became our substitute. The substitute that the law demanded, if you would. Since I wasn't dying on the cross myself for the sin, I had to sacrifice an animal. The Lamb of God was the perfect sacrifice. Do you get it? And since he fulfilled the law, remember, he said he didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. And he was the fulfillment of the law. He was that perfect sacrifice. And because he was that perfect sacrifice... His righteousness is imputed to us. My sins were placed on Him. And when I put my faith in Him being the Lamb that paid for my sins, His righteousness is imputed to me. Yeah. That's that simple. To those who believe. It is a step, faith establishes the law, if you would. It, 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 it proves the, the need for the law. Jesus fulfilled it. Now, I could go back through there and I could probably point out a few things. I know there was one thing. Anybody have any questions on anything in chapter 3? James, you got, you got chapter, uh, verses 13 to 19 in which he tells the world in verse 19 to shut up because they're guilty anyway. Mm -hmm. and that is the uh, physician calling the nation to his office. You go see a doctor, you have a physical examination. Years ago, a doctor at Grace Clinic in Brooklyn, New York, when you went there for a physical, it was two hours, take two hours. He did a tremendous examination thoroughly. He wrote Grace and out of his book of medicine to 
not only a physician, he was a teacher, he was a professor. But now, he will take a, 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 a tongue blade and he will say, uh, open your mouth. And then and Dr. Drake will take the tongue blade and press down on your tongue to look behind your tongue to see what was wrong with your throat, if anything was clear there or wrong with it. This is what the Lord is doing here. And he says to the world, he says, open your mouth. I want to see how she your mouth. He presses down and then he says in his word here, you all stink. Yeah, all Terribly, good. terribly stink. <laughs> and see, we're all in the same boat. I've witnessed to Jews over the years in New York. And they, uh, they're they always a little bit arrogant. They think they're better than Gentiles. But I tell you, they stink just as much as we do. You see, in order for us to smell good, we got to get to the cross. And then he takes away all the sin that then you smell like roses. Because you got his righteousness now, you see. How wonderful is the cross, huh? Amen. How wonderful. If the cross is not a doctrine, the cross is a foundation of all doctrines. Amen. Of all doctrines. Without it, we don't have any. That's right. There in verse 19. Uh, now we know. <laughs> that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. That's talking about the Jew. That every mouth may be stopped. He, you know what Paul's doing? He's holding the Jew up and he's going, yeah. I mean, basically it's what he's doing. You're no better than the Gentile. You, 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 you know, you're no better than they are. You have to get saved the same way they do. You're just as guilty and wicked as they are. Right. And that's what he's been doing all the way through here so far. He's been, he's been talking to a bunch of Jews who may have accepted Jesus, but were still trying to practice the law as part of their salvation. He was correcting them. He wrote a whole book trying to deal with that, the book of Galatians. Amen. But anyway, it, 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 this has been a pretty good, pretty good chapter. And what we're going to do is, we're not even going to try to start the next chapter. Anybody else have anything? Any questions? I know I covered that fast, but honestly, you could spend an you could spend an hour with each one of those sections and not do them justice. But if you just read them and just let it say what it says, it's simple. You just take your time, read it. Get 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 the gist of what he's saying and then move on. He's getting ready to get into something that's difficult uh, for a lot of people. He uses the illustration of Abraham in the next chapter. Read ahead and uh, you'll see why I say it's kind of difficult. Because uh, a lot of people get messed up doctrinally on uh, Abraham's salvation. They try to put Abraham under the law. Abraham was under grace. Abraham was before Moses was given the Ten Commandments or the law. you got to remember when Abraham was. But anyway, uh, we'll deal with that next week. Any questions? Comments? Yes, sir. So, you're talking about Thanksgiving. So, Thanksgiving is not actually a pagan holiday? No, Thanksgiving is actually a Christian holiday. The pilgrims... That's right. Uh, now, there were more... The Thanksgiving that, that is taught in school is, comes from the pilgrims that settled at Plymouth in six... Wait a minute. Uh, I got the date and it just left me. I got the date. I had the date that just left me. But the pilgrims that came and settled at Plymouth Rock, they settled there and they were... Uh, uh, thankful for a harvest they had. 102 set sail from Holland to get here. The first year, half of them died because of the hardships. They landed further north than they intended to uh, because of the weather. They had no idea. Had there not been someone on there, had the pilgrims not wanted to print a Bible, they would have died at sea. They brought a printing press with them, and the screw that was in the printing press they took out to put into it, one of the main beams that held up the mast for the main sail. Yeah. And that screw is what held her together till she could get here. Yeah. So it was the fact that they desired to print Bibles that saved their life. 
And then God's providence is all in it. Wait till I get there. When they get here, they landed further north in the wrong time of year, snow on the ground. The first, the first winter, half of them died, starved to death, froze to death. Uh, uh, when, they, when they did do some exploring, they found mounds in the sandy soils. And when they dug it up, it was corn where a tribe of Indians had stored it and covered it up so that it wouldn't freeze for their food for the winter and that they would have seed for the next spring. But the Indians was gone. They'd been wiped out by some kind of illness. They had left some abandoned, very rude, crude structures for them to live in. 1621, there, Gary, it just come out of the blue. I'd be going down the road and 1621 would have popped in my head. And I'd have thought, what was that for? But in 1621, they celebrated Thanksgiving after, after they finally had a good harvest. It was a couple years after they settled. Yeah. They had a good harvest. Uh, they met an Indian. That's where Squanto comes into play. That's an interesting story. Squanto himself was captured by earlier Englishmen and taken as a slave back where he learned English and he was uh, some monks got a hold of him and some other ones that were brought over there for slaves after after they had been taught English and released them then they came back to their home country so here's these settlers these pilgrims who struggling they can't catch fish the ground's too sandy the soil don't have enough nutrients in it for anything to grow they're further north than they thought. They thought they were coming into a settlement, but they're having to build all their all the structures, houses, and things for themselves. They're scared to death, don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, here walks in an Indian and says hello in English. They don't have to fight with the Indians because the tribe's been wiped out. It happened to be Squanto's tribe, and God had already brought him over here and prepared him so when he went back home, his people were gone. He realized that they found out that it was over some kind of illness or plague that it went through. He stayed there with them. He's the one that taught them how to catch fish. So they began to eat. Because their method of catching fish didn't work. He showed them how to do it. And he not only showed them how to do it, but he also showed them when, when springtime came, how they could take those fish and put them in the soil, and it would give the sandy soil the nutrients needed to provide for the corn and squash and so forth to grow. And they had such a good harvest that, that they decided that they wanted to give thanks because William Bradford, who was the governor, he recognized that Squanto was sent by God. And he said so in many of his writings. Uh, he was a historian. He wrote, kept records. And much of what we know of that first uh, pilgrim colony there that we know of, the first Thanksgiving, uh, what, what we know the most about it comes from his pen. And it wasn't to thank the Indians for what they had done. It was to thank God for how he had blessed them and yeah. what God had done. Yep. He recognized everything as the providence of God. It was God's providence that they didn't drown at sea. God had already made preparations and having the printing press on board. It was God's provision they didn't starve to death. All of them didn't starve to death. Why? Because God already had the Indians bury some corn. Are you with me? It was God's providence they didn't get wiped out the first year. Why? Because God wiped out a tribe of Indians before they came in. It was God's providence that pushed them further up north. They hit the storms that drove them further up north. God's hand was all in it. And they recognized it. The problem is we don't recognize God's hand today. We say, boy, wasn't I lucky? Boy, wasn't that a struggle of? Well, we look at somebody and say, boy, ain't they lucky. No, that's God blessing. Amen. It is a Christian holiday. It's, it, it is a Christian holiday. That's why, that's why the, uh, uh, they already have Christmas stuff out. 
See, the world don't, don't really appreciate this like the Christian should. We should not want anything to do with other holidays. We shouldn't want Amen. anything trumping this holiday. Yes. But you know what they're doing? We're going to have Black Friday sales early this year. You come on in after you eat your dinner, rather than spending the whole day thanking the Lord, you're going looking for deals. People are more concerned about eating food and getting good deals than they are thanking God. That's right, brother. They just run it over. Yep. News don't talk about this, but you know the news will have a thing on the news telling you where Santa Claus is. The weatherman's up there showing you a picture of where Santa Claus is traveling. Yeah. You still don't think about how dumb that is. And we're supposed to trust these people? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> something there. But yeah, I, I want to do something on, on on that. I think it's very, 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 very fascinating. And, and again, like I say, it was not the first Thanksgiving. There were several Thanksgivings before that, but they didn't resemble what we recognize as Thanksgiving. They were just uh, explorers and people that come over and just declared a day of Thanksgiving where everybody that came, they survived some 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 storm or they survived the trip over and they just wanted to thank God for his blessings and declared a day of thanksgiving. When's the last time a president has done that? Did you know for years that Thanksgiving was not a federal holiday? It wasn't up until Abraham Lincoln. So and he didn't declare and make it federal where it was Every year, he just declared it, and then every succession uh, uh, president had to each year declare the fourth Thursday in November a day of Thanksgiving. I think it was Woodrow Wilson that finally established it where it was every year. But when they had to declare it every year, a day of Thanksgiving, could you see the ACLU now? If a president got on, got up on national TV or got up on radio or got up, had it put in the paper and sent out across the country declaring the fourth Thursday in November a day of thanksgiving dedicated to giving thanks to our creator, our provider, our savior. Boy, wouldn't that change something? How far the apple has fallen from the tree. All right. Any questions or comments on that? All right. Let's all rise. It's 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 eight oh two. I appreciate your attention. Now, did I go too fast through that chapter? Okay. I just.